It's always nice to share ideas with individuals such as yourselves. One of the most important things we've realized in our very short lives is that our ability to understand the universe as it really is, is limited by our human understanding. I'm going to make a profound statement. I believe that management theory will undergo a dramatic change within the next two decades. Why do I say that? It's abundantly clear that the amount of complexity that we perceive in the environment out there means that our models, our linear predictive models, are no longer capable of coping with this complexity. And I'm going to explain this world of complexity by looking at four examples. I'm going to talk about floods in Thailand. I'm going to talk about traffic jams. I'm going to talk about dinosaurs. And I might even talk about the wonderful idea of virtual reality. But let's get underway in terms of our presentation. Why did I call my presentation Three Men and an Elephant? There's an interesting parable about three blind men that were asked to explain what they felt by touching different parts of the elephant. That must have been an Indian elephant, because you can't easily do it with an African one. But one guy was hanging onto the tail, the other one was feeling the tummy, the other one were hugging the leg. And they all gave a true reflection of what they perceived to be true yet it was only a partial view of reality. And unfortunately, that's what we see and experience on a daily basis. You see, the world around us, the universe, is based on three ontologies. The ontology of predictable systems, where the cause and effect relationship is predictable and repeatable. The world of chaos, where there is no links between the elements within a network where there is no link between the cause and effect relationship. And then the world of complex adaptive systems. This is where the cause and effect relationship is visible in retrospect, but never repeats. This is a world where there's constraints on the agents in the network, and as the constraints change, so does the agents, and the other way around. Unfortunately, we ignore the last two ontologies completely, because it's not part of our daily lives. The thing is, we have perfected the world of physics. We understand the cause and effect relationship. We can send a spaceship into space and have it land on an asteroid after a 10-year flight. We've got it right to understand the cause and effect relationship in the physical realm. We've built an understanding of the world, this clockwork universe, by if, by looking at each of the underlying parts, we can describe the whole. So by understanding how each one of these components work, by combining it, we have an insight into how the world works. Well, that's how we think. We use that mindset and we apply it all over the world of science, not only physical sciences, but social science as well. So we create organizational structures and we give each individual in the organization a specific task, as if they'd magically guide the organization to its guidance, to a goalpost somewhere in the future. And there are two mistakes with that mindset. Firstly, we don't really know where the company will be in 12 months. And secondly, we all know that if you make a measure a target, it stops being an effective measure. So imagine an organization only run on the key performance indicators that you give the staff. You'll never get anything done. The important insight is that a new requirement, a new theory is required for a world of increased complexity. Forget the idea to use reductionism to explain everything around us. If we take a look at predictability, we see that even something as simple as a water wheel, the moment we get more information or more water coming to the system, it becomes unpredictable only after a few turns. Now, if we see unpredictability in a controlled environment, imagine what happens in a business, in a country, in an organization, that has multiple inputs. Forget about the world of predictability. We need to look at different models to understand the world around us. Let's take a look at what's happening in Europe right now. Monsieur Trichet, the governor of the European Central Bank, said, when the crisis came, the serious limitations of our existing financial models became apparent. His words are reflected by others. It says, you know what? The models that we are using is no longer valid. 
We live in a world that becomes more and more unpredictable. When the European Central Bank brought out bonds a couple of months ago, they thought that the market would react in one way. It reacted in a completely different way. We live in a world of increased complexity, and the question is, what do we do next? Well, George Box said, all models are wrong, some are useful. <laughs> in the world of physics, a theory will hold for 100 years, and when it's proven wrong once, it overthrows that entire base of theory. But in the world of social science and economics, if you are accurate, 60% of the time it's perceived as being a good model. Understand this, all models are wrong. Sometimes they're useful. It take, a model takes this world of complexity and reduces it to something that we can understand. But in the process, a tremendous amount of valuable information is lost. We need a new way of looking at the world around us. In terms of cause and effect, let's test your knowledge of science, shall we? If I let this card go, what will happen to it? Are you sure? If I let it go, where will it go to? Down, okay, well, let's test your hypothesis, shall we? Okay, I, I didn't anticipate that. Let me try it again. What will happen if I let it go? Okay, I, I think it's gonna go up, move left, and then fly out the window. Let's see. Okay, I didn't get that either. But what happens if I do this at the top of the Empire State Building? Or if I do this in space? The moment the environment starts playing a role in our actions, we can no longer predict its result. And that's what we need to start realizing, that the models we've created are extremely narrow. We need to take a look at what happens in the world of complexity. We talk about necessity and sufficiency. If I take that acorn and I plant it outside, will it turn into a tree? No, well, the corn is necessary, but it's not sufficient. And that's what we need to start realizing. The world and the impact of the world on events has got a huge focus on changing our mindsets of what's predictable or not. Werner Heisenberg famously said, we have to remember that the way we observe nature is based on how we perceive it. We need to change the way we look at the world around us. And because of that, a fascinating world emerged about four or five decades ago, the world of complexity. Over the last decade and a half, these giants have taken that insight and make it applicable on the world of management. A lot of the theory that I'm going to discuss today is based on the world of Dave Snowden, one of the giants in this field. So let me give you some insights into this fascinating new world, this new world of management science. For me to explain this world, I need to explain new words to you. I need to introduce new words to you. And don't worry, we're not going to have time for 25 of them. I'm going to introduce you to eight new words. No, these aren't words that I've made up. They are words that come from the world of anthropology, evolutionary biology, virology. They explain how complex systems work. These are the words we need to learn as well if we want to be effective in the world of management. And the first word we're going to talk about is a fitness landscape. Now, this can be viruses competing for dominance. These can be pop songs competing for attention. They can be technology standards that compete with each other. And these fitness landscape tells us what's happening in the world around us. If we take the inverse of a fitness landscape, then the valley signifies stability. We talk about strange attractors. And if you're on a boundary condition, a small move might lead to a radical change in that ecosystem. So let's talk about attractors. Your temperature in your body is a strange attractor. If you get cold, your muscles start to shiver and you move back to your temperature of 37 degrees centigrade. If you're cold or if you get hot, you start sweating and your temperature moves back. But if you're in a serious car accident and it pushes your temperature onto a very dangerous position, a boundary condition where you might either fall into the valley of death or return to the valley of life, doctors have realized that if they drop the temperature of your body and they put you in an induced coma, your chances of survival increases after a few days. So creating a temporary attractor so that you perhaps can fall back into the valley of life. So, we talk about the network effect or the butterfly effect. That is only truly viable in a world where there isn't stability. So when you're on a boundary condition where we are looking at a new technology standard about to be launched, then the, bat the, the butterfly effect is extremely valuable. 
because it tells us that minor changes might lead to a massive change in this fitness landscape. The third word we're going to talk about is not narrative inquiry. This is a fitness landscape built out of stories. And Dave Snowden and the gang a few years ago did some research on radicalism in Pakistan. And there they realized that in one of those peaks where there's instability, they came across a very interesting narrative that most of the radicalism wasn't exported from Pakistan to the United Kingdom. It was actually imported from the United Kingdom into Pakistan. This was four years before the rise of ISIS. Weak signal detection showing us how the fitness landscape will change. The third word is acceptation. Now, acceptation means that something is developed for a specific purpose and matured for a specific purpose. And then at some point in time, it changes its character and used for something completely different and in the same process, change the environment. So scientists, as of late, have realized that dinosaurs had feathers. Yes, Jurassic Park that you're watching right now, dinosaurs weren't naked lizards. They all had feathers. And feathers were developed for warmth and for sexual display purposes. And then on one day, one dinosaur decided to glide from one branch to another branch. And flight emerged. And the entire fitness landscape changed as a new species redefined the ecology. I always ask my daughters, how many dinosaurs have you seen this morning, honey? And she normally tells me how many. How do we use this insight in the world of management? Well, in Thailand, there are yearly floods. And as the floods come, you always have to park your car on a big or on top of a hill or in a big parking garage. But what one of the guys did, because of the growth in GDP in Thailand, a lot of people had cars and there were no parking spots left. So a week previously, a big couch was delivered to one of these individuals. And when the floods came, he parked his car inside one of these bags, tied it up. The floods came and the floods left and his car was fine. And almost overnight, he started selling bags for cars. And now you'll get a bag in almost every single garage in Thailand. Acceptation. Apple is brilliant at acceptation. If your company is faced by disruption, most companies would then say, but let's continue to do what we do because we need to increase the linkages with the technology and the market. But as we are being disrupted by the world of e-commerce, let's create the separate entity that might react accordingly. Ripping the company in essence in two. Our advice is don't innovate, accept. Because the shareholder would simply sell the shares in the company that will be disrupted and simply buy shares in the company that will do the disruption. But you can let the company survive by utilizing their skills in a completely new business environment. Acceptation. This was taken here in the high felt. This is an anthill with termites. Now, if you take an ant and you make them the size of a human, that anthill will be the size of New York yet there's no centralized control system. They've got an excellent food distribution system. They've got nurseries. They have a wonderful traffic management system. There's no centralized intelligence. If you put five ants down, they wouldn't know what to do. Put 100 down, some will bugger off, and some will get some food to eat. Put 100,000 down, and intelligence emerges. This shows you that you cannot use a reductionist thinking to get to the core of how a system operates. And how do we use these insights on a daily basis? Let me give you an example. If you do landscaping, do you get an expert to tell you where you need to put the paths? Or do you plant grass and see where people normally walk? And after you see where they walk, only then do you put the roadways in. That's emergence. This is one of the most effective traffic management circles in Europe. It's called the Magic Roundabout in Swindon. You never know where traffic's going to come from. So what they did is they started playing around with boundaries, the fifth word. So by changing the boundaries, they tried to determine how effectively the switching pattern was. And after a couple of months, they started solidifying the boundaries, started painting them, and we started getting one of the most effective traffic management circles in Europe. What is interesting is that you, it brings us to the last or the second last word, and that is identities. So if you're a local, you actually can use it quite easily to zip around all the circles and pop out the other side. 
But if you're a tourist like me, you take the safer route all around. So what is the identities that you use? I'm bombarding you with a number of new words, and there's a lot more. We need to move from the world of command to control to self-organizing systems, from plan to emergent, from robust to resilient, from complicated to complex. It's not one or the other, but both. And that's the most important thing, this fitness landscape and how we can act in it. What is fascinating is that in this world of complexity, we do not know what the results of our actions will be. You see, the world that we have here, where we sense, we categorize, respond, that's the world of physics that we know. The complicated world where we sense we need to bring in an expert and then we understand how it works. But those is the, that's the world of analysis. In the world of complexity, it's different. Here we probe without knowing what the results will be. And then we need to sense what the actions is of our probes. And only then can we respond. And we see this in politics around the world where people make the wrong policy decisions and get the exact opposite of what they anticipated. And then we have the world of chaos, where you simply have to act in order to stabilize the situation. We don't use modulators in those fields, or sorry, drivers, we use modulators. A modulator means that we do not know what the outcome of our actions will be, but our sensing networks need to be very finely attuned. Forget about the methodologies we learned in the world of physics to do sense making. We need to start looking at narratives and micro-narratives, looking at the patterns of how people interact with each other, because the stories we tell each other is how we see the world. And by analyzing micro-narratives, we are enabled to understand how the world truly works. In terms of innovation, it's not the one or the other. It's this constant flow between the world of complex and the complicated. And once we get the ideas, we solidify them. If it's difficult coming up with ideas, we dip into chaos. And if a good idea comes around, we make a good business decision and solidify it into the world of predictability. It's not the one or the other. The three men and the elephant is really about expanding our view of the world so that we understand that we cannot manage everything based on the ontology of order. I promised that I'd predict the future. So in those valleys of stability, what can we see? Let me tell you what we'll see. We'll see environments where you will wear a wristband that will monitor your heart rate on a continuous basis. And the moment the heart rate deviates, they compare it with other people that had heart problems, similar to yours. And they can detect an hour before it happens that you will get a heart attack. A guy will come and knock on your door and say, hello there, sir, please come with us. You're going to get a heart attack in half an hour. <laughs> That's what's going to happen in the next two to three years. We're going to start seeing complete redefining elements in value chains. We're gonna start seeing virtual reality helmets that people will wear, where we can take a camera and record a movie show. We can put these cameras in live concerts, and you'll be able to experience a live concert sitting at your house. You'll also do the same at sport events. Very soon, we will be able to do a couple of very interesting things in cities. Uber and Google might merge, because those wonderful cities are all struck by traffic jams. And what we'll see is that one of these predictions, that in the year 2025, London will stop you driving into the city center unless your car can drive itself. And then your car will drop you off at their office and it'll, you'll tell your car, now bugger off and go park somewhere else. And then, but you say, no, no, on the way, pick up a few other people so that you can make some money. So as the self-driven car drives around and picks people up, we start seeing cities changing. Because now you don't need to have parking garages in the city centre anymore. We can now live in the middle of them. Self-driving cars will change our cities look. We can make these predictions based on that areas of stability. What is important, however, is understanding that the world is not predictable. It's about constantly challenging the boundaries of our knowledge Complex adaptive systems shouldn't only be taught at universities, it should be a subject at school. Only by pushing the boundaries of our knowledge can we harness these insights to make tomorrow a better place. The only question is, how far down the rabbit hole do you want to go? Thank you very much.